Hello, I'm Jason Lee. It's an honor to be back for Oktoberfest with the Orangeburg German Swiss Genealogical Society. Today I want to talk about DNA privacy, particularly in the context of doing DNA testing for family history. So I'll go ahead with that. Um, just letting you know that you can find me online at Facebook. Um, I'm often in the Ancestor DNA Matching Facebook group. Uh, that's where we obviously uh, talk about Ancestry DNA match results, but um, as resourceful researchers, we also talk about our experiences with 23andMe, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, and GEDmatch. Um, we have over 101,000 members in the Ancestor DNA Matching Facebook group now. So um, any question that you might have, eventually someone will come along and give you a good answer. It probably will come along pretty quickly. Uh, we have a really enthusiastic group. I've been a genealogist, genetic genealogist, for about eight years now. Um, I did a little bit, dabbled as a child, but genetic genealogy really drew me back in, and I've been having a good time with that for uh, many years now. Uh, my usual full disclosure statement uh, essentially boils down to the fact that I do not benefit from the sale of any DNA test kits at any of the uh, DNA testing matching companies. So I come to this with a very independent perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, concerns that come up in terms of privacy with DNA testing. Um, so I want to emphasize from the beginning that I fully support and strongly recommend DNA testing for genetic genealogy. And I want to emphasize that I use GEDmatch regularly, almost every day. So in the context of talking about privacy concerns, I want to be sure that everybody knows that I really recommend these services. So moving on to uh, issues of DNA privacy, um, I talked about this once before, um, a bit after the Golden State Killer case came back into the headlines in 2018. Um, DNA privacy continues to be a topic of big discussions. Um, I think it's simmered down a bit since um, 2018 um, when things really exploded, but um, it's still a big topic. So. I'm going to cover the issue of DNA privacy again. I'm going to talk about some of the facts surrounding um, DNA privacy. I'm going to give you my opinions. Uh, there are a lot of other opinions out there. We have to approach this topic with some humility because ultimately um, the discussion boils down to opinions. Some people are comfortable with um, things that other people aren't comfortable with. Um, I'll make my recommendations, but everybody has to decide um, for themselves. So again, um, the Golden State Killer case um, really grabbed a lot of attention in 2018 and there was a lot of uh, fear out there, I think. Um, this is a comment that I think was made partially in jest, but I think it does uh, boil down two lines of thought pretty well. First of all, a lot of people were really happy that um, a terrible killer had been brought to justice, but at the same time, um, there were some concerns and there were some questions about this new technology and um, how powerful is it, what can it do, what should we, what should we be concerned about. So um, there was some relief and fear at the same time. I would say that if we fully explore this issue, we might uncover a few um, uncomfortable facts, but I think it's a good idea to look at all of that unflinchingly and I think that if we um, dig into the issues, even if they're uncomfortable, in the long run, we'll feel better about all of this and we'll make better decisions. So um, in my opinion, even though there are some legitimate concerns and that, uh, that we need to pay close attention to, uh, DNA testing for family history and for ethnicity is very safe. So that's another point that I want to emphasize that um, I think echoes um, the points that I've already made. Um, 
I think DNA te testing ultimately does come down uh, to some privacy tr trade-offs. You have to be aware of those trade-offs, comfortable with those trade-offs, um, and um, if you um, think about those things carefully, you won't be as likely to um, have a negative reaction to headlines. Um, we can't possibly anticipate all of the ways that DNA testing technology might be used, but I think if we put a lot of thought into the possibilities, we'll be prepared for most of what comes in the future. There are risks that you can't control in terms of privacy, privacy, privacy compromises with DNA testing. So um, we, we just need to think about that. And at the same time, there are some risks that we can control. We can do some things to protect ourselves, and uh, we need to take advantage of those um, opportunities. So we'll talk, talk about steps that you can take to um, protect yourself. And I think one of the main things that I want to um, drive home in this uh, discussion is that even though there are some risks, they're fairly small, and we need to put the risk in perspective. Uh, life is certainly not risk-free, um, so we need to think about um, privacy risk and, and put those uh, concerns in, into good perspective. In my own DNA testing journey, I did start off with uh, several concerns, and um, I worked my way through those concerns before I did any testing. So some of the concerns included the possibility of uncovering family secrets. Um, it's becoming fairly common now uh, because the databases are so large, there's so many people out there who have tested, uh, secrets are being uncovered, uh, half-siblings are turning up, uh, close family members that uh, weren't known are uh, becoming known, and um, that's something to be prepared for. Um, there, there are a lot of surprises out there. A, a lot of these surprises come close to home, and we have to be prepared for that possibility. So I, I prepared myself for that. I prepared myself for potential health scares. I started with 23andMe, and they provide health information. So I thought ahead about the possibility of unwanted health information or unexpected health information and embraced myself for that. Um, I thought about potential discrimination, particularly as it, res as it relates to um, genetic predispositions. So you want to think about things like that. Uh, think about the possibility that hackers can uh, get into these databases potentially. Um, I think most of these companies work really hard to protect us against that possibility, but there are no absolute guarantees. So even if everything's happening the way it's supposed to be happening, if everybody's really doing what they're supposed to be doing, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, there's a possibility that hackers can get into these systems and cause problems that nobody really expected. Um, law enforcement and involvement of other government agencies has grabbed a lot of attention. That seems to uh, really get reporters excited, and so there are a lot of stories in, in the um, in the news that uh, reflect these concerns, and so it gets a lot of attention. Um, it's not a, as big of a concern for me personally, uh, but different people have different opinions about how concerned we should be about that possibility. Uh, that's something that um, each person has to decide. And then one of the um, issues that I was not prepared for when I did my DNA testing was the possibility of sharing data with distant cousins. Um, I was not aware that that was something that um, this kind of DNA testing offered, and so I was really completely unprepared to be getting messages from cousins saying, hey, we share DNA, let's do some research, let's find out what's going on. Um, I was not expecting that, so I wasn't fully prepared, and I had to spend some time looking into that to know what to do. So um, that's how I got into it. Everybody will come with different priorities and different concerns, um, but that was um, my early experience. Ultimately, despite my concerns, and I think some of them were um, relatively big concerns, um, I decided that my curiosity outweighed my fears, and so I went ahead with the testing. And I think that's really the process, the basic process that we all have to go through. We, we, we want to think about the possibilities and make a decision as to whether our desire to know more, our desire to explore outweighs our fears or not. And then I think uh, we saw a spike in fears and anxiety when um, there were big headlines about the Golden State Killer case. Um, 
again, I think the fears and anxiety has started to taper off. Um, it's been tapering off probably for a good while. We're two years down the road. So um, the shock and surprise that came with these headlines is starting to fade away. But um, I do think that um, we, we need to continue to be, prepare ourselves for, for big news, for unexpected um, possibilities. Um, I think with the um, anxiety and fear that came after the Golden State Killer case, um, we can look back and see that there was probably inadequate preparation for this kind of possible, this kind of unexpected uh, news story. So going further back in time to um, the years leading up to uh, 2018, um, we can look back at the arguments and discussions that people were having, and we can see how maybe um, many of us were somewhat unprepared. Um, and one of the big questions, even before the Golden State Killer news stories bubbled up in 2018, there was a lot of discussion about whether genealogy tests could be used by law enforcement. And there were a lot of experts who were saying it wasn't possible. Um, and, and that turned out to be wrong, of course. But um, I want to revisit some of those arguments and try to learn from what happened uh, before uh, things got really interesting. So uh, one of the arguments was a chain of custody argument, and this is a quote from a fairly prominent um, genetic genealogist. It says, while it's possible that law enforcement agencies could potentially obtain your DNA results from a testing company, it's unlikely. There's no chain of custody for DNA test results from a commercial genetic genealogy company, meaning the law enforcement agency cannot reliably ascertain that the DNA came from you. So um, that was an often quoted and often paraphrased quote. And um, we know now that that didn't quite um, address the issue. Another um, argument was the CODIS argument. And this is an, another quote from another uh, prominent uh, genealogist. The markers we test for in genetic genealogy are not the same markers the police test for in law, law enforcement. As genealogists, we're looking for genetic evidence of how we are like other people, other family members who share common ancestors with us. So genetic genealogy tests look to identify common factors that help us to group people together. Those markers, those characteristics, aren't really useful to the police at all. What they're looking for, what is coded in the combined DNA index system, CODIS, are the parts of the DNA that make us unlike other people and set us apart as individuals. So adding the genetic genealogy databases to the law enforcement databases would literally be adding apples to oranges with a predictable result of fruit salad, not evidence useful in court. So again, another argument, uh, well-reasoned, based on facts, um, but it really fell apart after uh, the Golden State Killer case came out again. So partially correct, or at least technically correct, but largely irrelevant, very influential. I think uh, these arguments um, gave people a sense of security, a sense of reassurance that uh, they didn't have to worry about law enforcement involvement in genetic genealogy. Um, for me, it's not really a worry at all, but for those who feel uncomfortable with the presence of um, investigators uh, law enforcement investigators within these databases, um, it was a sense of, it, it provided a sense of uh, security. Um, but um, with that false sense of security, um, I think there was uh, a lot of panic uh, when it uh, turned out that uh, the arguments really didn't apply and um, were essentially incorrect. So let's not forget these um, arguments. Um, I'm not pointing out these arguments to say that uh, the people making these arguments uh, made a big mistake. I think they were doing the best they could with the information they had. Uh, we can't possibly anticipate all of the future um, applications of this technology. Um, so really, I think the best we can do is to um, expect the unexpected. Um, and, and realize that um, we can't perfectly predict the future. And um, we have to know that um, 
things might unfold in very unexpected ways. So before I go any further, I want to, uh, I want to do a quick science review. Um, I want to talk about some terminology that will help us as we go forward. Uh, the genome is all of the genetic information needed to build and maintain an organism. So all of the DNA um, in each one of your cells, that's the genome. The human genome consists of approximately 3 billion DNA base pairs. These base pairs are the letters that spell out your genetic code. And that DNA, those 3 billion DNA base pairs, are packaged in 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you might think of them as being like 23 pairs of books containing together billions and billions of letters. And this is a picture of the human genome, the 23 chromosomes, or 23 pairs of chromosomes from Wikipedia. And you might think of each one of these chromosomes as a skein of yarn. If you unravel a skein of yarn, or in this case, unravel a chromosome, you get a string of letters that spell out the genetic code. Now, the uh, genetic uh, DNA testing companies test what are called SNPs, SNPs, SNPs. SNPs are special letters of the genetic code that vary from person to person and from group to group. Uh, most of the genetic code is exactly identical uh, for all people everywhere in the world, but um, SNPs are special letters that give us our unique characteristics. And um, the DNA testing companies that we use for genealogy focus on the SNPs. Um, there are roughly 10 million SNPs in the human genome, and again, that's out of 3 billion total uh, letters in the code. So the SNPs represent only about 0.3% of the entire genome. So they're really a, a small fraction. Um, of those 10 million um, SNPs, the DNA testing companies that we use for genealogy focus only on about 600,000. So again, a fraction of a fraction. In fact, um, the, these SNPs that are tested um, comprise only about 0.0002% of the genome. It's a very important but tiny fraction Matching SNPs reveal biological relationships and shared ancestry. So people who share uh, many SNPs uh, are more closely related. And that's how we um, work with our um, DNA matching information to draw conclusions. The number of SNPs tested at a first cousin comparison only involves 0.00005% of the genome. So again, a very tiny fraction um, sometimes it helps to visualize these numbers, and so um, I'm going to show some uh, chromosome browser comparisons. Uh, this first one is a father-daughter comparison. So this is what 50% looks like. Uh, parents and their children share 50% of their DNA. A father shares 50% of his DNA with his daughter. This is what 50% looks like in a chromosome browser. If we move on to uh, first cousins, you could see that the amount of shared DNA drops off quite a bit. So these purple bars, in comparison to the purple bars from the previous slide, um, they represent the amount of DNA that first cousins share. So you can see that's a lot less than what we saw with the previous slide. And then moving on to second cousins, the drop-off continues, and it's a pretty rapid drop-off. So we can see that as the relationships become more distant, the amount of DNA shared becomes much less. And uh, to give you some specific numbers in this specific second cousin comparison, um, over 14,000 SNPs were compared, and um, or over 14,000 SNPs were found to be matching, but that's out of 3 billion total base pairs in the genome. So it's a tiny fraction, an important and helpful and powerful fraction, but at the same time, a limited amount of information. So again, I want to emphasize over and over, uh, genetic genealogy comparisons are very powerful, but at the same time, they're also very limited. We don't want to uh, exaggerate the, 
the, uh, the power of what DNA testing can do. We really want to understand where we are with this. So moving back to the issues of privacy, I want to talk a little bit about informed consent. Informed consent is very tightly wound up in the issue of privacy. So um, I would say that there's, there's a real problem generally in DNA testing with respect to informed consent. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the informed consent agreement and, and, and Ancestry DNA. Um, Ancestry DNA is a big player in DNA testing. Um, they have an informed consent agreement. I've gone through that. Um, it's difficult to read, actually, um, and, and I think that's, that's a problem because we really want people who go into DNA testing to understand what they're getting into. Um, but the informed consent agreement uh, provided by Ancestry DNA is pretty tough to get through. Um, I brought up this topic in one of my DNA groups, and one of the first questions I got was, what does this all mean in terms a simple person can understand? And so that prompted me to take the text of the consent agreement and put it into a readability calculator to see how complicated is this really. And what I found that is that the consent agreement is very difficult to read. Um, the calculator gives it a, a gunning fog index of 13.1. That's a high number. That means it's difficult. And in fact, uh, the very first paragraph of the consent agreement comes in with a score of 17.2. So that's really almost off the charts. Um, and that means that it is very difficult to read. An ideal readability score would be around seven or eight. Um, anything above 12 is generally considered to be too hard for most people to read. By comparison, the Bible, Shakespeare, Mark Twain, all have scores of around six. The Wall Street Journal has a score of about 11. And of course, the Wall Street Journal isn't generally considered to be light reading. So when you're talking about a score of 17.2, uh, 17 you're talking about a uh, text that's very, very difficult to read. And so I think most people are probably getting to that first paragraph and they're getting completely blocked, bogged down and they're, they're um, bailing out. And, and I, I know there are probably a lot of people who never even start reading it. But for those who really want to know and really are interested in, in trying to understand what they're getting themselves into, I think they're probably getting completely bogged down in the first paragraph. And that's unfortunate because there's a lot of important information after that first paragraph. However, in spite of this, I think that um, most people are signing the consent agreement. Um, 23andMe says that about 80% of their customers are signing the consent agreement. Um, we'll go through the consent agreement. I'll hit some highlights. I'll stick to the things that uh, should be reasonably easy to understand. Um, I think you have to read through the consent agreement more than once to really understand all of this. So I've done that and um, I'll, I'll, I'll hit the highlights and we'll talk about um, what I think it all means. So they start off saying that um, their consent agreement is part of a research study on human genetics, genealogy, etc. Uh, sounds like good lofty goals. Um, you get a little further down into that, they say that the research may be performed by third-party researchers. So that's where we're getting into some important information. Um, if you um, sign the consent agreement, you're not just agreeing to let Ancestry work with your data to learn things about genetics and health. Um, you're also giving them permission to share and sell your genetic data and other data to third parties, but you're not Getting specific, uh, you're not getting specific information about who those third-party researchers are. Moving further, uh, they say that your consent to participate in this research is completely voluntary, not required. Uh, you can sign up for Ancestry DNA and get all of the features of Ancestry DNA without signing the consent agreement. Unfortunately, this sentence is past that first paragraph that I think probably stops most people in their tracks. So I don't know that most people are seeing this portion of the consent agreement that says you don't even have to sign this in order to use Ancestry DNA. But it's true. You do not have to sign the consent agreement in order to use Ancestry DNA and have access to all of the features. So again, the consent agreement is not required, although the terms of service agreement is required. So there are two, two items that you're confronted with when you sign up for Ancestry DNA and for other services like Ancestry DNA. 
uh, the terms of service agreement, that is required. The consent agreement is not required. Um, Roberta Estes wrote a very good um, article about this uh, years ago. I think it's just as relevant as it ever was. She says, I did agree to the terms of, uh, excuse me, I did agree to the terms and condition uh, which are required and my kit was activated. However, let me say right here, right now, you do not have to agree to the consent agreement to activate your kit, although it does not say that clearly on the signup page. And given where this box is placed, it certainly gives the impression that you need to click both of these boxes to activate the kit, but you don't. I did not agree to the consent agreement, Roberta, Roberta Esty said. And I, I agree with all of that. I think it's, these are very important, important uh, these are very important points. And um, like her, I did not agree to the consent agreement. I rejected the consent agreement. I went to my Facebook group and I uh, put out a survey and I wanted to see um, how many people actually signed the consent agreement. It turns out that most people who responded to the survey didn't remember. They, they weren't sure whether they signed the consent agreement or not. Um, a smaller number said they did sign uh, the consent agreement. Some said no. A very small percentage said they agreed to the terms of service agreement, but did not sign the consent agreement. Um, I'd like to see more people in this category and fewer people in this category. Um, if you do go through this process, I would hope that you at least remember what decision you made. Um, and I would certainly encourage a lot of people to give serious consideration to um, agreeing to the terms of service, which is a required, but um, holding off on the consent agreement, which is optional. And I think that the consent agreement, the way that it is written, really isn't, um, really isn't acceptable. So moving down further through the consent agreement, um, there's a section entitled, What Am I Agreeing To If I Consent? Um, they say researchers may use all data that you provide to us when you use our services. So we're not just talking about DNA, we're talking about all data. Data includes the DNA derived from the saliva sample, of course, but also your family tree and other data that you provide when you register, create a profile, or use your account. So if you use your account, um, you're providing data and they're using that data as they see fit. Um, and as an example, you might remember that um, at one point you um, did some, put some information to uh, create your profile page. Uh, and when you create your profile page, you're asked for a lot of information. Um, not everyone um, provides all of the information requested, uh, but the requested information includes your name, um, your gender, age group, education, occupation, religion. So um, think about that when you think about signing a consent form. Um, this data, this information can be bundled up with your genetic data and handed over to third parties uh, for a profit. So um, you may be comfortable with that. If you are, fine. Uh, go ahead. Um, if not, um, be careful to um, make the right decision when you sign up. Um, they say what data is used. Additional data would include biosensor sensor data recorded by mobile phones, uh, activity trackers, health, uh, health and wellness data collected from other devices. So um, that's a lot of information. I'm absolutely not happy uh, providing all of that information to Ancestry DNA to be sold with uh, my genetic information. Um, I would think that a lot of people would uh, be hesitant to provide all of that information. But that is the kind of information that Ancestry DNA intends to help themselves to if you do uh, sign the consent agreement. We, Ancestry DNA, may contact you from time to time to request, request additional information for the project, like a survey about your eye color or caffeine consumption or even a new DNA sample. So most of that sounds pretty superficial, not very serious, not a big deal, eye color, caffeine consumption. Um, but to get a better idea of the kind of information that they would like to get from you in the form of surveys, um, I'll um, point out that um, there was a personal discoveries project that
that included several surveys that was rolled out a while back. Um, I don't know if some people are still getting this. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, but it asked a lot of very interesting questions. Um, and uh, to be clear, the uh, information that um, Ancestry collected with these surveys was intended to be used in their research project, which includes uh, the genetic information. So uh, they were clear about that, said your answers may be used in scientific research if you agree, if you agreed uh, to our informed consent. So if you agreed uh, to the consent agreement, if you signed the consent agreement, um, you had already um, agreed to allow Ancestry to collect this information and use it as they see fit. So the Personal Discoveries Project, although it may have given the impression that it was designed to help you learn more about yourself, uh, was really designed to help Ancestry learn more about you. Some people are comfortable with that, but um, some of the questions seemed pretty invasive to me. So uh, we'll go through some of those. Um, a few of the questions were not really invasive at all. They, they seemed pretty uh, superficial. Um, one question was, do you keep up with latest fashion trends? Another question was, what is your natural skin color? Again, fairly trivial, I think. But then there were more substantial questions. What is your marital status? On average, how many days a week do you spend with friends? So how, how much time are you spending with friends? What is your social life like? Do you have any phobias? Uh, what is your current employment status? A, a, a big number of options there, 10, 10 options. How would you classify your current home? Do you live in a mobile home, a boat, um, a nursing home, a house? Uh, detailed questioning there. Um, do you rent or do you own? Do you live in an urban situation? Do you live in a rural setting? How many children did you have? Uh, did you ever uh, uh, serve in the military? Uh, have you ever had high blood pressure? When did you get your first period? Are you postmenopausal? Um, clearly, I'm not the only person who feels like uh, these questions cross the line. Um, Ancestry provided the option to skip uh, questions in the survey, and um, when you uh, clicked to skip, uh, they did indicate that they thought that perhaps um, they were getting into material that was really none of their business. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, Ancestry is really interested in a lot of detail, and um, you may or may not be comfortable giving them a blank check to share this kind of information with government agencies, uh, for-profit businesses, academic institutions. Um, there's really no limit to um, the possibilities. And um, Ancestry really spells all of this out in that lengthy consent agreement that uh, very few people read, I'm sure. Uh, they say that uh, the research in their project uh, may be performed by collaborators or collaborator partners. Um, that sounds, again, very broad. Uh, it could be third parties and uh, partners of the, the third party. So we're really getting further and further out on the limb in terms of how far this data can be disseminated. And to be perfectly clear, um, this is a uh, revenue generating enterprise. This is about making money. Um, Ancestry says, Ancestry DNA receives compensation from collaborators who work on the project. So um, they uh, share information and they get money for it. We really don't know, we have uh, no way of knowing um, how um, Ancestry is uh, disseminating this information, who they're giving it to, how many deals have been made. We, we just don't have access to that information. Ancestry is under no obligation to tell us this. Um, <clears throat> but we do know that it, in at least one case, uh, there was a deal with Google. Um, they um, made a deal with Google uh, we don't know the financial terms. Financial terms have not been disclosed, but um, Ancestry DNA made a deal with Calico. Calico is part of the uh, Google family of companies. So um, moving further through the consent agreement, uh, there's a section addressing specific risks. 
Ancestry spells all of this out. Uh, they say that uh, researchers outside of the U.S. may use your data. So as a U.S. citizen, um, you need to be aware that um, your data may cross international lines, may end up overseas. Um, DNA samples could be transferred, and in that process, they could be lost or stolen. Uh, there could be a security breach, and so then your data could become public. Um, and they do admit um, that third parties could end up identifying you from the research data that's disseminated. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and again, um, there are different comfort levels. Um, some people are perfectly fine with those possibilities. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they mention in one section that uh, when they share data and DNA, uh, they uh, remove your name and they remove your contact information and they remove other common identifying information. So they seem to indicate they're making an effort to uh, provide some anonymity. Unfortunately, however, um, they make no guarantees about stripping away all of the information that you um, couple with your account and with your DNA. So again, remember, um, your profile page contains your name and your gender and your um, age and your employment and your religion, potentially, if you, if you entered all of that information in. Um, and Cersei is saying, well, we're going to take away your name and we're going to take away your contact information, but there's a lot of other information that could really narrow things down. Uh, 23andMe uses similar language. They say that they de-identify your genetic data. Uh, the question is, does this provide an anonymity? And I think the answer is emphatically no. Uh, Linda Avey, co-founder of 23andMe, has explicitly admitted this. She says that it's a fallacy to think that genomic data can be fully anonymized. I think that's absolutely clear and becoming more clear all of the time. We'll get into that a little bit more. But a, a clear example of this is that um, uh, adoptees and uh, children who were conceived through sperm donation are every day finding family, identifying fathers by using services such as Ancestry DNA or GEDmatch to find biological fathers, to find biological parents. Uh, they uh, do this so routinely now, it, it really doesn't even grab our attention anymore. And um, that really clearly shows that um, not only can your DNA be used to identify you, uh, but your relative's DNA can be used to identify you. So an anonymity is really a thing of the past as it, as it, as it relates to uh, DNA and DNA testing. Um, and we're, we're seeing more and more people who have uh, really come to see that this is clearly true. And I would say, I would go so far as to say that DNA data is ID. It is ID. It is identification. Um, it's more powerful in many ways than photo ID or fingerprints or sing uh, signatures or uh, social security numbers. And I hope that if we've learned anything from the news, uh, particularly the news of the Golden State Killer case, we've learned that DNA data is ID. I hope that that we at least learn that one lesson. Um, again, this was a, an explosive story back in 2018. I did a survey in my Facebook group and I asked about um, how, I asked people how they felt about it. Uh, the overwhelming number one response is they were happy that the killer was caught. There were a lot of other responses. Uh, most of those were positive. But again, I wanna, sh I, I wanna emphasize that this crime scene DNA um, helped to identify a killer, and it did so without his name, without his contact information, and without other identifying information. Um, it was DNA, DNA match lists, uh, family history analysis, looking at family trees, good old fashioned research that uh, genetic genealogists do every day, that uh, adoption search angels do every day. Um, and again, you can remember back Ancestry and 23andMe and the other companies say, 
we'll share your DNA, but we'll do it without your name. We'll do it without your contact information. We'll do it without other identifying information. Uh, what we know now is that with all of that information stripped away, uh, we can use DNA match results to identify the source of the DNA. So um, let's, let's remember that we don't need names and contact information and other identifying information to uh, identify people with DNA. Um, it, with uh, genetic genealogy, we don't need any of that. Uh, those things do make, make it easier, but it, it's not necessary. So now we have a name. Uh, crime scene DNA uh, led to an arrest, and now uh, the Golden State Killer has been sentenced to spend the rest of his life in prison. So a very interesting case. I really think that it was cause for celebration. And um, I'm glad that we have this tool. Um, and beyond that, I'm glad that we now can say, here is the potential. This is not just an abstract idea. Um, we were beginning to see that these kinds of possibilities um, might come into existence. These um, possibilities might come into fruition. Um, now we know it's been done. It's been done successfully. And I don't think we could have asked for a better case to illustrate the power of genetic genealogy and to really make things clear so that people can make their decision and say, I want to do DNA testing. I want to help with this kind of thing. I want to do my own research. I'm, I'm comfortable with this. Some people, however, have been frightened by this power, uh, although a lot of people see it as a good thing. Some people are frightened. Uh, we can let people decide for themselves. However, um, in the wake of the Golden State Killer case, I think we're seeing some new myths crop up. So we mentioned earlier there were some assumptions that uh, DNA testing that we do for genealogy could never be used for law, enfor law enforcement purposes. That turned out to be false. I think we're seeing a new wave of falsehoods, a new wave of myths crop up. And I really want to try to shoot those down so that these myths don't provide um, a false sense of security that will lead to another wave of anxiety when we find out these uh, reassuring myths are actually untrue. So I'm gonna go through these and uh, talk about how they're incorrect. I think we'll, we'll see very clearly that they're incorrect as we go forward. So one myth is that uh, terms of service can keep law enforcement out of the DNA databases. Um, that's absolutely incorrect, very clearly incorrect. Another myth is that there are technical obstacles that prevent law enforcement uh, investigators out of some of the DNA databases. That is also incorrect. Uh, there is a myth regarding law enforcement potentially having special access to uh, DNA and genetic information that is somehow different from the access that the rest of us have. We'll talk about how that's false. And um, another myth is that HIPAA reg regulations somehow um, have some bearing on any of this. Um, for people who work in the healthcare industry, um, HIPAA regulations are very familiar. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So the terms of service myth goes like this. It says the terms of service at the DNA testing companies prevent law enforcement investigators from using the DNA databases. This is absolutely incorrect, and um, this has been really clearly uh, shot down by some smart people who really know what they're talking about, and they know the law. So Matthew Feeney, policy analyst at the Cato Institute, wrote an article entitled Genetic Informants in the Hunt for the Golden State Killer. And in that article, he said the Golden State Killer investigation did not rely on investigators directly accessing GEDmatch customers' information. Rather, it relied on GEDmatch to do what its product is designed to do, find relatives. Uh, it's a good article. I recommend reading the whole thing. I think that was the most important quote. I sent an email back to him. I said, um, I would assume that law enforcement would not be particularly concerned about terms of service violations, but would there be any legal hurdles? Could law enforcement legally submit a crime scene, a crime scene DNA sample to Ancestry or 23andMe without permission from a court? 
uh, Feeney responded to me or responded to me and said the potential law enforcement violation of Jed Match's terms of service in the Jed, uh, Golden State Killer case is one of the interesting issues associated with the case. I believe that Oren Kerr, a law professor at USC Gold, Gould School of Law, is probably correct when he points out that police violating Jed Match's terms of service probably did not violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as that law makes an exception for law enforcement. I believe that a law enforcement agency could submit discarded DNA to 23andMe and or Ancestry without a court order, even if doing so would violate the uh, terms of service. Feeney said, it would be hard to argue that you have a reasonable expectation of privacy to DNA when you leave it at a crime scene. And customers who volunteer their DNA to genealogical sites for the purpose of automated rel relative discovery hardly have a legitimate privacy complaint. After all, the police were not seeking their records. Rather, they were relying on GEDmatch's service to do what it advertises to its customers, DNA and genealogy research. So I went uh, to some articles written by Oren Kerr, and I think uh, those are also worth reading. He says that you can think of this as a kind of uh, undercover operation in that the police were perhaps posing as the Golden State Killer looking for family DNA matches, but that's not a Fourth Amendment issue as police have always been allowed to do that under the Fourth Amendment. He goes on to say, at least right now, it seems to me that collecting evidence about a person who voluntarily submitted it to a million or so people and submitted that information with the goal of having it compared with another million or so people is pretty unobjectionable. As a result, I think it falls into the category of good police work and not creepy overreach. And that was in an article entitled Tentative Thoughts on the Use of Genealogy Sites to Solve Crimes. It's a good article, and uh, if you have an interest in this topic, it would be a good one to um, look at. Um, I've put links to various articles in the PDF file that I created for this slideshow presentation, so I'll try to get that out for people so that they can follow these links. So again, I agree. Um, I think this is pretty unobjectionable police work, and the bottom line is investigators use these databases the same way we do. They um, submit DNA, and they look for matches, and they analyze those matches to put together family trees and figure out who the DNA came from. Um, and police, uh, in that they're using these databases the same way we do, uh, are not using this information in some special way. They don't have special access. They're not digging deeper than you and I do. Uh, so this myth about police having special access to DNA, uh, that's a, a myth that has really been busted. My uh, view on this is that um, the police are basically crime scene search angels. When they're using DNA from crime scenes and uh, using that DNA with uh, family tree analysis, looking at matches and, and coming up with a family tree and identifying uh, perpetrators by using genetic genealogy, they're basically uh, functioning in a way that's very, very similar to um, the way that uh, adoption search angels um, do their research. And so um, when police are using DNA um, and genetic genealogy, they're really functioning as crime scene search angels. That's my opinion. So we've had this kind of uh, collision, um, two worlds, law enforcement and genealogy. Uh, some people have really been excited about that. They're happy to see what's happening. It's very interesting and uh, they have no concerns at all. Um, other people um, are not comfortable with that, to say the least. Um, but again, I think um, we're seeing some uh, myths crop up that are giving some people some comfort. Um, they don't want to think that um, law enforcement uh, investigators really have the same access that you and I do, and. So we're seeing people who are coming to the assumption that because Ancestry DNA and 23andMe um, acquire your data through uh, collecting saliva samples, you send, a, send in a saliva sample, they uh, extract the DNA 
and um, they analyze the DNA and they come up with a match list. Uh, because um, saliva is part of this process, some people have come to conclude that crime scene DNA cannot be used at 23andMe or Ancestry DNA uh, because crime scene DNA is not DNA uh, from fresh saliva, it's DNA from blood and other materials. It's, 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 a, it's a different um, bodily fluid. So um, people have come to the conclusion that um, 23andMe and Ancestry DNA are essentially inaccessible to crime scene investigators. But um, I think that's very clearly incorrect. That assumption is uh, poorly founded. Um, I call this the myth of technical obstacles. Um, I addressed this myth. I went on to Facebook and asked my friends about this. I said, I'm not convinced that getting crime scene DNA into the databases at 23andMe and Ancestry would be difficult at all. Any thoughts? Um, one of the people who responded to me um, is a Facebook friend who runs a DNA testing lab, uh, has a PhD from an elite European university. He essentially said, um, using crime scene DNA at Ancestry DNA or 23andMe would be relatively easy. Um, as long as the sample is a good sample, um, the DNA could be amplified by PCR and the um, DNA uh, that uh, came out of that process could be used to simulate a, a saliva sample, no problem. Um, and I think this is absolutely true. PCR is not really cutting edge technology. It's being improved all of the time. So the PCR that we use today is better than the PCR that um, people were using years and years ago. But PCR has been around for quite a while now. Uh, Kerry Mullis won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1993 uh, for his contributions uh, to the development of PCR. So PCR is not new, it's well-established technology, and it's easy to see how um, crime scene investigators could um, easily use this tool to um, simulate a saliva sample and send that in directly to 23andMe and Ancestry with little or no difficulty. And I would say, um, I would be slightly surprised if they haven't already tried this. Uh, we really don't have any way of knowing. Uh, we may never know, we may not know anytime soon anyway, um, unless this bubbles up in some court case, but um, I, I really don't see any barriers. So I think this is another uh, uh, myth that has been busted. If investigators in um, the United States have any qualms or reservations about using Ancestry DNA, I'll uh, say that I think that the rest of the world probably does not. It sounds like uh, people in Sweden are really ready to move forward and they're not uh, going to hesitate. Uh, you can read about that. Finally, uh, the final myth that I will talk about is the myth of HIPAA protections. Uh, people who work in health care are very familiar with HIPAA. HIPAA, reg HIPAA regulations basically put limitations on how um, medically relevant data can be shared and spread, spread around. Excuse me. Um, many people have come to assume that because uh, DNA tests have some medical relevance, um, HIPAA regulations would limit uh, the use of DNA and uh, would limit the extent to which uh, genetic information can be shared or sold. Uh, I always had doubts about whether HIPAA had any relevance at all. Um, Ancestry has addressed this very clearly now. They put out a privacy statement very recently within the past couple of weeks, um, and they very clearly said HIPAA provides no pro uh, protection at Ancestry DNA. It's irrelevant. Um, HIPAA regulations don't apply to com uh, companies such as 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. So a few closing thoughts. I think that we've learned a lot over the last two or three years about privacy and DNA. Um, one thing that I would urge people to do is to be careful about um, initial reactions to headlines. The news headlines are often inaccurate and misleading, and so we should be slow to react to these headlines. Uh, let's be cautious. Um, I think uh, GEDmatch has been unfairly um, blamed 
um, for the anxiety that people have had with respect to some of these high-profile cases. Uh, first of all, I don't think anybody's been harmed. I think people have been helped. It's good to put bad people behind bars. Uh, I've seen a lot of good, uh, but there has been a lot of anxiety. And um, Jedmatch is a small company. They don't have deep pockets. They don't have the money to do a lot of symbolic uh, fighting in the court. Um, I think that attempts to fight this technology and to keep uh, uh, law enforcement from using um, this kind of uh, technology the same way that uh, adoption search angels use it is futile. Um, I don't think that courts are going to say that uh, law enforcement agencies have fewer rights than adoption, uh, adoption search angels. Um, I think that if we're going to keep law enforcement out of the genealogy databases, there are going to have to be new laws, and, and I just don't see that coming very quickly. So let's not blame the little companies that are trying to help genealogists do their work. Um, they really don't have any power to stop this. Um, legislators might have the power to stop it, but GEDmatch doesn't have the power to stop it. Uh, these companies really uh, can't do much. Um, so let's be careful about scapegoating um, people who are caught in the middle of this. My strongest recommendation, if you're really worried about genetic privacy, you want to do the best you can to protect your own genetic privacy and still go ahead with testing, I would say uh, opt out of all of the consent agreements at all of the DNA testing companies. Go with the most uh, conservative option that you can find. Uh, don't allow these companies to share your data far and wide. Um, tap on the brakes, tell them, okay, you know, I have to agree your, to your terms of service so that I can get your service, but I'm not going to I'll give you a blank check to sell, your, sell my data or share it with just anybody. Um, I think that if these DNA testing companies are going to be sharing and selling data to third parties, it really should be on a case-by-case -case basis. So they should have to come to you and say, hey, we're interested in doing some research with Google. Uh, we want to sell some of the data to Google. Is this okay with you? You say yes or no. Um, but that's not how this works. That's not how this is configured at this point. At this point, the DNA testing companies are saying, just give us permission to do whatever with whoever. And I think that's just too, too broad. I, I don't think that that's appropriate. Um, and I think that that's a way, uh, opting out of all of that is a way to say, um, I want you to be careful. I don't want to um, have my DNA all over the place. So that would be my recommendation. I've opted out at all of the DNA companies. Um, I'm not really comfortable giving a, a, a blank check to everybody uh, for anything that they might want to do. So another uh, uh, piece of advice, stay up to date. Um, these things are always changing. Um, I would say go ahead and uh, read the privacy statement that it was updated at Ancestry on the 23rd of September. We've got some fresh information to comb through. Take a look at that. Finally, thanks again for having me again. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And um, if you have any questions, please email me at jxleefam at gmail.com, jxleefam at gmail.com. Thank you.